Welcome to the Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast, also streaming on expertcrsecrets.com, where we believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them, they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax deferral options. Not having a clear plan is the enemy, and using a proven tax deferral strategy, such as the Deferred Sales Trust, is the best way for you to exit. Highly appreciate it. Cryptocurrency, commercial real estate, businesses, primary homes, all tax deferred, not using a 1031 exchange so you can create and preserve more wealth. Hey, I'm your host, Brett Swartz. In each episode, I'm joined by some of the best real estate, financial, wealth, and business minds in the world where they share their ideas, deal stories, and inspiration. So together, we can make complex tax deferral strategies simple and passive income plans achievable. I'm excited about our next guest. He actually oversees the underwriting of projects, financial uh, performers, debt and equity strategy, and company growth, and is focused on the viability of projects at Red Oak Development Group. He also um, is connected with the Partnerships and Investor Relations. He has more than 15 years of business experience and has owned and successfully operated four separate companies and has been a sponsor on more than 140 deals. Please welcome to the show with me from the great state of Texas, Mr. Tom Staub. Hey, Tom, how you doing? That's right. And we we refer to Texas as a nation here. (laughs) It's true, right? It's like the nation of Florida and Texas. It's like a whole other world. I was just in Florida over the weekend. And it's a uh, it's a cool spot. I haven't been to Texas in a while. Although I was in Dallas, uh, actually two months ago, I was in Texas, uh, seeing Tony Tony Robbins at a commercial yeah. real estate event. So Austin is exploding. We can talk about that here in a little bit in a minute. Yeah. But before we go there, would you tell us a little bit more about your background and your current focus? Yeah. So um, you know, my trade is not in real estate uh, in the beginning. I, I started off in, you know, at, at Morgan Stanley in Wall Street, um, in the consulting world, then corporate finance and tech, um, and then found real estate about 12, 13 years ago, as well as serial entrepreneurship. And um, they kind of go hand in hand. And if you look at where the markets have shifted over the last 10 years, there was a time in which you could do big flips, commercial building flips, syndications on already existing buildings and make a lot of money. That time has been passed. Um, in the last two to three years, we've pivoted and focused mainly on land development where all the, the big margins are today. So we, we primarily develop in Arizona outside of Flagstaff and uh, primarily or, or secondarily around Austin, Texas. Fantastic. Yeah, that would be fascinating. We'll dive into all of those things. Yeah. And our topic for today is basically building wealth with land deals. Um, and we'll be we'll be uh, focusing on that here in a minute. But before we go there, I also want to take one other step back. I think it's kind of a cool background with Morgan Stanley and the yeah. tech background. And uh, but I want to take one other step back even before that. Perhaps even when you're in high school or early days of college, you know, Tom. I believe we've all been given certain gifts. Some people call them strengths. Some people call them, uh, you know, superpowers. I believe they're they're God given gifts, and they've been given to us to be a blessing and help to others. So I'm curious, what are those one or two gifts that you believe you were given, and how does that help how you help and bless people today? You know, it's amazing. Um, way back, uh, I saw my mother be a phenomenal saleswoman. I saw my dad be a relationship guy. And I knew I always had the, the interpersonal sales ability to do sales and probably do well at it. But I never wanted to be a road warrior and all that. And, um, you know, as you would have it, real estate definitely requires networking. So um, some time ago, I knew I had to just pony up and uh, use those skills to network and really form the relationships that are required to do real estate deals. And I'll tell you, it, there's, from my experience, land development deals, um, and even bigger real estate deals really require people to sit down over dinner, handshake, uh, you know, break bread through drinks. And so that's skill number one. Number two is, you know, I come from a finance background. There's this old blockbuster video of me when I'm like five and they asked me, you know, Tom, what do you want to be whenever you get older? And I said, I don't know, but I love numbers. And that was at age five, right? And so numbers have always been in my forte. So combining those two, I think, are a pretty powerful um, hybrid for these deals. Yeah, absolutely love that. Yeah, that's really cool. So finance and the numbers background, but then also having the mom and the dad, mom, more uh, traditional sales, dad relationship, can kind of combining those two. And yeah. then you, you caught the thing about networking, which is really neat. I had, I had the privilege and the honor to be a part of your your amazing conference that you put on recently and uh, and be able, was able to speak at that. And so I appreciate that opportunity. But just the high caliber of guests that you had on there. I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe share just 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 because I kind of want to bring that network thing to life here because yeah, sure. there's like networking and then there's like being able to to bring on and connect people on a very high level so just share a couple of the guests that you had on your conference and maybe even plug that for, for next year as well yeah so we uh we have a nonprofit. it's called the uh rei academy which is short for real estate investing academy we have a small 
YouTube channel, but mainly we do in-person events or now virtual events. Um, and for, through that network, I had the likes of, you know, Bill Danko, who have, who has written two books, bestsellers, you know, 4 million copies. Uh, Michael Zuber is a bestselling author as well in real estate, um, kind of a big name. The CEO is of Hemling.com, uh, CEO of Matt Owens, the real estate CPA, Brandon Hall. Um, you were on fantastic and just others, right. That really are the experts in real estate investing. Um, and I think my goal in all this nonprofit is, and I tell my clients this too, if you work with us, you're not just getting a, an asset uh, product or an asset class, you're going to get access to the tax accountants, people like yourself. Uh, and those teams, what we call the power teams is really what it takes to, to form the wealth, the legacy wealth, not just a million dollars. wealth. I'm talking multi-millions, right? You got to have those teams in place and those, this network that we have formed allows people um, to get that team. So. Yeah, I think that's a very well said, that power team, taking the networking and then actually applying it, right? Because it's one thing to be connected with a lot of people, like, you know, the LinkedIn days or social media days. Yeah. It's another thing to take that and actually apply it practically, right, yeah. with education. And I like the way you put that, form the legacy, uh, you know, power teams, form the legacy wealth, because you're right. Those who've helped you maybe get to the millions maybe aren't the ones that are going to help you get to the tens of millions and then the tens of millions to the billions. And right. I think that's that's very powerful. So that being said, let's dive into how, how to uh, build wealth with land deals. So, yep. Tom, what's the number one secret to uh, to building wealth with land deals? Yeah, it's it's not. I mean, I think we all know what dirt is, right? <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's a lot more... Uh, approachable than maybe like the stock market or option trading or any of that, right? You know what land is, you know what a sewer line is and water lines and all that. So I think understanding what a deal looks like is a lot easier for people. But um, when it comes to picking the right deals, and I'll just start there, it's kind of the same as how I would look at if you were to give your money to a, to a um, rehab flipper, right? You want to know who the operator is. That's, that's my team. Um, so that's step one. What is their experience? How many exits have they had? How do they pick the right deals? Who, are, who is their team? What is that team's experience? All that stuff, right? Um, two, uh, I think the deal itself. And if I were an investor, I, I always encourage my clients to, if you're looking at other people who are doing land development deals or even syndications, ask them for their two or three year cash flow statement. You know, they look at P&Ls a lot. They look at potential returns, but they don't look at what actually matters, which is the cash flow management of that operation. So again, going back to the finance piece, right? And so um, I would say the operator num number one, and then the project itself, but more importantly, what does that cash flow look like over the course of the project? And is that exit uh, timely enough to secure your exits? Okay, excellent. By the way, you can connect with uh, Tom Staub at redoakvc.com. That's redoakvc.com. Okay, so um, understand that it's real estate, right? And yeah. I guess in one sense, keeping it simple, it's not the stock market. It's not options trading, not overthinking it. Maybe that's the way to put it. Yeah. And and then two, understanding the actual deal itself, right? Um, as well as the operator and asking them for, um, you know, I guess evidence or, or, or track record. Is that a fair summary so far? Mainly, yeah. I, I think what you'll find in these deals is that the numbers sort of speak to the location. And what I mean is you hear a lot about location, 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 which is important. But um, it's not always the number one important factor, right? So, but yes, to your, to your question, those are the two top ones that I would be looking at. Excellent. And so let's talk about some locations too as well, right? You talked about Arizona as your particular focus or niche right now. Could you tell us how you chose Arizona, what you like about Arizona, and, and what, what the future you think holds for, for continuing to build wealth and land deals there? Yeah, now I'll keep this at very macro levels. Um, so I think most of us know there's a population migration happening, right? And that's coming from the Northeast, the Midwest, um, even the West Coast now, as we're seeing into what is known as the sunshine states or the smile states, right? So that's sunnier weather, pro-business, anti-regulation for the most part, um, pro-development, that sort of mantra. And when you look at who is going to be capturing most of the population growth of the United States, most people are going to tell you it's Arizona, Texas, uh, Florida, Southeast, maybe the Carolinas up in that region. Um, it's, it's that smile, right? And so, um, we knew that and real estate and land is a measure of supply and demand. It's not a complex uh, equation. You just got to balance that supply and demand. So people are moving that creates demand. Right. And so um, we picked Arizona for a number of reasons. 
Uh, one, we like pro-build city, cities. What that means is uh, fast approval timelines, right? So four to eight months to get all the permits, surveys, engineering, entitlements, all that stuff. You compare that to like a California, for example, and we were actually looking at Joshua Tree as a potential market, more of a speculation market, but we knew that permits would be three years, right? And you think about today, I mean, three years from now, the you know mortgage rates might be 6%, who, who knows? Um, so you can't operate in environments that take so long to get through all those processes. So again, pro business, pro build, low regulation states, um, and that that was Arizona number one. And then um, we looked at Austin because it's kind of a no brainer. I mean, you know, we have 184 people moving here per day, right? And if we just assume half of them require homes, you know, you need at least 90 uh, or at least 45 homes to house uh, those 90 people, right? So, and I'll tell you that there's not enough homes being built in Austin to, to meet that demand. So conditions are very ripe for very strong margins in these deals. And we're seeing that as builders and developers are going out of the city core. I mean, to a point now where DR Horton, KB Homes, they're targeting an hour outside of Austin, right? And land's still very cheap there. So us developers can, can capture the upside of that migration, even outside of the core city. Excellent. Okay, so you're looking at the net rate migrations, you're looking at the smile states, pro-business, uh, pro development, shorter time frames for approvals, right? California, where I'm located, yeah, it's, it's it's like it's like they're doing everything to like drive the businesses out. I think it's Oracle, yeah. HP, and Tesla Definitely. all within the last year moving all of their headquarters to Austin, Texas, yeah. right? In particular, like you're saying, 184 people per day. That is staggering, right? Then you have yeah. good states like Florida, right? I think Tennessee is another good one too, right? Alabama seems to be pretty pro business, doing really well. Yeah, the yeah. Carolinas, um, of course, yeah, and then Arizona. So that's really fascinating. So you have population migration to places that are very pro business, right? And yeah. then you have, um, I guess what would be the next step too to to now looking at, I guess, of course, it's the path of growth, right? It's where, where things are going. It's having that intimate knowledge. Yeah. It's intimate knowledge since you're in Austin, Texas. So what, what would be the next step? Yeah, so I think um, there's a lot of next steps, but I, I think where we like to play, um, and this is where I, I think builders are going to, right? Builders are building smaller homes with smaller lots. They're going higher density. That's that's kind of the name of the, of the game right now. And uh, the sweet spot for the housing market, where, where I think it is, is between you know a quarter million dollars for a house if you can find it to about a half million dollars. Right. That that's a, a segment that even in a recession or downturn is still going to have strong demand. And in a good times, it'll have the people who are entry level buyers buying in that category too. So if you think about it in, in let's say for example like like rental classes right a class is the luxury grade b class is kind of the standard um you know product c class is kind of the rougher parts of the of the, the city well in bad times people from a go to b and people from b go to c right in good times c goes to b b goes to a that b class is always in demand it's the same sort of thing with real estate so what we do is we find areas path of progress areas that are really targeting that quarter million to half million dollar product so that no matter what happens in three to five years, we have strong demand behind us, right? And in fact, I'll take it a step further. In our numbers, we make sure that in crash money. And there was a recent report, I think from the IMF, um, that said, you know, they're always measuring what potential downside could happen of all the worst case scenarios come to fruition. And they predict, um, in the worst case scenario, we would see a 14% correction across real, broadly across real estate, right? So our 20%, crash scenario has to work too, right? So path of progress areas with that strong demand product and then in a crash, do we still make money? I like how you're reverse engineering that. And that's very well said, right? You're starting with, with hey, what's something that no matter how the coin falls, right? You know, uh, if the economy keeps in a bull market or if it goes into a bear market, if we can focus on that 250 to 500 path of progress, path of growth, right? Segment of, of, of single family homes and rentals or whatnot, that are, that are typically smaller lot sizes, smaller deal sizes that are recession resistant because people are going from B to A and back from A to B or from C to B. And it's kind of right in that sweet spot. And as long as you stick to those fundamentals, then you're, you're pretty good shape. Is that a fair summary on, on that point? That is. Now, what's interesting is I've been kind of bare on the luxury uh, market, but the luxury market is doing fantastic right now. So my theory could be way off. But I still don't want to be playing building, you know, two million dollar homes and then being stuck with ten homes at that price. 
So. Right. No, exactly. Base hit versus the home runs. And sometimes it's better just right. to get the double, the double, the double right. versus always swinging for the fences and then make it strike out and lose a lot. So now yeah. I think that's wise. And I think that's a, uh, that's a good approach. So, okay. So now let's talk about practical, you know, uh, amounts here. Right. So, a uh, hundred thousand dollar investment, right? Um, and you'll promise our future results, right? But like, what's some of your track record with Red Oak? What are you seeing there? And what kind of investors are you looking? Uh, yeah. You know, credit investors. What, what kind of give us a little bit of feel for the for for the for the offering? Yeah. So the journey of a um, of someone in my shoes, uh, it, it gets easier over time, and mainly because cost of capital comes down, right? As you prove more success, you have more successful exits, like 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 we've had. Your people have have confidence that you can deliver your, your plan. Right. So when I first started doing these deals, I had to offer 30% preferred returns in, uh, each year. Right. Um, so first in line profits, uh, my debt cost was 11, 12%. Right. So very costly, um, capital stack. Now over time, that's come down to what we're, we're now offering 20 to 23% preferred returns annually. Um, and then debt costs is eight, nine percent, right? And that'll come down, you know, more. And eventually, it'll be around eighteen percent on equity, um, and around six to eight percent on debt. And that's kind of the standard for all the best of the best. Um, in fact, my sponsor is part of my team now to help produce that cost of capital. So investors, long story short, can expect low twenties annually if they're an equity partner. Um, we do profit sharing on deals that we, whenever we build, let's say multifamily, um, you know, communities, and we hold those. That we offer between a 10 to 20 percent profit share to investors um but across the board they're earning about a 20 to 25 percent return on their money uh, each year yeah that's fan that's fantastic and those are those are interesting numbers and of course they're probably lo longer deal cycles but maybe not can you guys give us the time frame on average yeah. hundred thousand dollars today in 20 you know you know we're recording this in october of 2021 Fast forward is 2022. What, what are you looking at as far as timing? One, two, three, four years? Yeah, or? Shortest, yeah shortest timeline is going to be 14 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, longest timeline is going to be 36 months. Okay. Now, I, I tell people, think about, and I, I'll just say it like it is, as an investor, that's great for you. You make the returns, but for me, that's an expense, right? So mm -hmm. I have a, essentially a credit card that I'm paying, mm -hmm. right? That has collateralization against my assets. So I'm encouraged to pay my investors off faster to reduce that high cost of capital, right? right. So basically we, we backload our personal profits in the project. So if it's a three-year project, I still want to pay off my investors in 18 months. Mm -hmm. If it's a five-year project, I'll target that three-year period to pay them off. And that remaining year, that's where I make money. Got it. And to clarify, it's a preferred return but it's also equity ownership or is it really just a, 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 a lending? Are they lending the funds? You just paying them back. Can you clarify that? Yep. So important point. Um, we just kind of separate the two. So we more or less, what we do, we say, think of the equity as a debt more or less. Um, you can't take the land if we don't make money for you, but if we make money, we, we will be able to pay you at that 23, 25% rate. Okay. Um, but you do also own an equity piece of the land. So if for whatever reason we don't make money or we have to sell it, uh, you do get some money back from your investment. So it's okay. not quite like debt, but it's, it operates in a very similar manner. Perfect. Excellent. It makes sense. And then the profit sharing, if, if you were to buy a piece of land or, hey, all of a sudden you see an opportunity to build 100 units, 300 units of apartment complex somewhere, yeah. and you make that work, then you work out a profit sharing of 10 to 20% 20, 20 on that side. Is that a fair summary? That's just flat. So that um, yeah. those, there's a debt side, equity, and profit sharing. It's never combined. It's typically Got just it. one. Awesome. Great. Perfect. So we talked about uh, the first secret, right? Which is you know the deal itself, the operator, the path of progress, the migration patterns, and then understanding you know uh, putting yourself in a position not to lose too much, right? Should things switch yeah. from A, B, or C, and then it's actually now uh, doing the deals, and those are some phenomenal returns. So for how, how long have you guys been doing it? And it seems like it is kind of a space that's a bit of still of a niche, right? It takes maybe, yeah. maybe a little more patience, a little more. Uh, um, let's say um, understanding of the nuances between um, you know city officials movements, right? It's not just buying a land from maybe a no, private person. It's it's working with all of that. So just explain the team that you've 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 built to to, to capture some of those challenges. Yes, yeah, so take about a minute or two. But um, from the team side, this is really important, right? My team is absolutely solid. My my director of the operations spent 15 years at ExxonMobil, 
um, basically working with local governments to build the biggest rigs in the entire nation, right? So when it comes to schmoozing politicians or schmoozing local, local officials, he's the guy on the ground, right? Um, he's a very likable man. He walks into the room and everyone just grab, grab hate towards him. That's the kind of guy you want, right? Um, so that's that's him. And then my engineering team is, they have 27 people on staff, uh, very seasoned. Um, again, back from the oil days, but they have tradition into residential, um, very complex projects they've done in the past. They lead all of our engineering work. Uh, um, my sponsor, who is, think of it as like the advisor on our projects. He is the biggest developer in Hawaii. Um, he has worked with Steve Wynn, the guy in Las Vegas to build those themes casinos. He's one of the masterminds behind that. Uh, he's also one of the biggest developers in Southern California, you know, doing multiplex theaters and um, century mark theaters, hotels. I mean, th this guy just got back from Bulgaria building two casinos. Like it's, you know, it's next level. So he comes to the table as the gray haired man in the room to make sure that we have the experience that we need. And I tell you, just we're looking at a student project housing and a five minute call with him saved me $5 million on the design. I mean, he's, his, his knowledge is extensive, right? And so just those three parties alone offers enough um, experience to more or less make sure that the deal goes to fruition. So um, perfect. That's fantastic. A dream team, right? Which we can't be overstated, right? Having that experience, having that the, the connector with the city, having the right. person who's gone through all of the blood, sweat, and tears yeah. to um, to be on the other uh, other side of this. So keep going. You're, you're going to say another point yeah, there. So I'm, I'm not foolish to assume that I know everything, right? So um, these these people keep me honest and keep things aligned in our projects. I even have a. Um, uh, my my project manager was one of my first hires ever in my uh, my my life, and she was like an admin back in the day, CPA by trade, absolutely meticulous on it. Her sole job in our company is to uh, manage all the project timelines and basically smack the whip on anyone who's behind the, on the, the timeline. All right, so we have a dedicated resource just for that. Um, but I think you had a question about Arizona as to what it, like why or what our ideal was there. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, just. Um just Arizona, you had mentioned in the beginning. So yeah, what you like about it, you talked about the migration coming in, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. kind of a smile state, it's pro-business, but anything else to add any, any other, any other nuance to Arizona that could be helpful for, yeah, for I mean, investors? Well, we got started in Arizona. Um, that was our first state, right? And our first project was, was the, it would have been damn near impossible to fail that project. So it was our first one too. So we knew we wanted to get into land development. We took a chance. It was our guinea pig project. Um, we learned a ton and I only had one outside investor in the project did not want to expose my clients to that risk. So a lot of it was my own personal money. And you know, that, that those two, three years, we learned a large amount. Um, and this, this is an industry that you learn a lot very quickly. And, um, once we've proven or proved the concept out there, we expanded it in Arizona. Now it's very dialed in. And once we had, once we had those operations dialed in, we took those learnings and we brought it back to Austin, which, surprisingly is easier to work in than Arizona, um, like, like substantially easier. So uh, it's been it's been a dream to work here in Austin. The cities are absolutely fantastic. Uh, just today I had a, a, a meeting in Lockhart, which is the barbecue capital of Texas. And um, just, just a great community of people that really are behind you on your visions. And that's, that's hard to find. A lot of states are, you think about politics and regulations, you think about hurdles, you think about red tape. And these are cities and councils that really want to see it come to, to life so long as you add a dog park over here or you don't you know, sure. pollute, pollute something over there, right? So right. it's been great. Yeah. Fantastic, Tom. Thanks for sharing that. And then we're going to shift a little bit here to our segment on focusing on capital gains, tax deferral, right? And so background is being commercial real estate, grew up in the business, and then Marcus Melchap brokerage, and I'm EXP commercial for brokerage. And then, of course, I have capital gains tax solutions. And, you know, the story is essentially that people got – trapped a lot of them did they felt trapped in the 05 06 07 market overpaid for property and a lot of them got hurt when the when the kind of the music stopped and yeah. so we pivoted we learned about something that's an alternative called a deferred sales trust but i'm curious what's your biggest frustration that you found when it comes to the 1031 exchange and or you know um a capital gains tax deferral as it pertains to your clients or your assets when you're selling yeah so um one i'll Again, I'm, I'm, I'll be working with Brett here very shortly on our own strategy to do this deferred sales trust. So I, I, I do believe in the, uh, the instrument itself. Um, but going back to 1031, I, I think the limitations around the like for like can be a big problem, uh, especially in an environment where you bought in a oversupplied market, easy to find deals, and now you're in a situation where you can't find a deal that cash flows. So uh, that like for like parameter is the 
um, the short timeline to execute on a, basically a bad deal right now, it's it's kind of bad timing with 31 exchanges. Um, so I would say there's that piece. And, and oftentimes you don't have an advisor to kind of help you through the process like you do with your product, right? You have a team behind the operation that can guide your clients through the process. If you go to a 1031 exchange person, they're just a you know coordinator. They don't do anything. So I think uh, you know the advisory, the timing of the market, I think just more of the nimbleness of your product is a lot better than the 1031 exchange. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, we call that the shotgun wedding, right? You got 45 days yeah. to get engaged and 180 days yeah. to get married. And we've all had friends or family that got married in a short period of time and yeah. it doesn't always be a, a great outcome. And um, so you want to make sure you're finding the deal and you make the intrinsic value of it make sense, right? You're buying it on the cash flow and the ability for, you know, more land to be developed. And then it's also equal or greater value, which typically makes equal or greater debt. And all of these little parameters make it kind of like a blockbuster way of doing things. It can be very challenging. And so the deferred sales trust is the answer. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com where you can eliminate the need for the 1031 exchange. Again, it works for cryptocurrency, works for primary homes, businesses, and it's a unique way to sell high. And then you can partner with the trust and buy low. In fact, you can buy land. You can develop land. And we'd have a client wow. out of Alabama, and his biggest thing, he was selling about $2.6 million, and he didn't have the like kind. But second, he's building 70 multifamily units in Tennessee. And so the timing of it is broken up into certain segments. At, he, he accesses the funds um, during different time periods. And in the meantime, it's earning interest while it's waiting on the sidelines, right? Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, hard money lending. So very flexible. Again, so capital gains, tax solutions.com. That being said, Tom, we're out of time. Do you want, are you ready for the lightning round? Let's do it. All right. So uh, knowing uh, what you know now, if you can go back to your 25-year-old self, what's the one golden nugget you'd make sure to tell yourself to do? Absolutely. No, just network a lot more. Get out there uh, and surround myself around, you know, bright, wealthy, strategic people that are also high integrity. Beautiful. Number one book you've recommended the most in the past year? Oh, man. Um, uh, what's the one by Victor? The uh, Funding Man's Search for Meaning? Absolutely. Man's Search for Meaning. It's not a book of fun, but it's, man, mm -hmm. it is a, it's phenomenal. Excellent. Uh, number one habit that you use to delegate. Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a book that Brandon Hall actually sent me, but um, it's, it's called Who Not How, right? We often get stuck in the weeds thinking about how to do things, process, building it out. When we start thinking about who can do it for us, um, that's been really helpful. I also think about anything that is repetitive in nature in your life can probably be outsourced through some system or person. Excellent. Very well said. Um, this is part of the uh, Rich Dad, new part of the series here we're doing. It's the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series uh, where we're talking about the number one concept that uh, you try to establish in your real estate investing based upon the Rich Dad, Poor Dad strategy. So any thoughts that come to mind there? Yeah, I think, um, I, I don't believe it's in the first book, but the cash flow quadrant is really important to understand. And, uh, you know, trading time for money, uh, money for money. So I, I think, if you value time, which you should, uh, you probably want to be the the E or the I. Um, that that quadrant, not complex, but a really powerful message behind that. Very well said. Uh, second to last question: What are you most curious about right now? I am dying to know um, a few things. So, you know, in my world, I'm looking at commodity prices all day long. Where do I think prices will go? Um, I think the Evergrande and real estate debacle in China. Thank God we're we're not connected to that. Very 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 glad they didn't let our banks into that country. Um, but those commodity prices are, are going to plummet. Copper, cement, PVC, and that's all good for builders and developers like myself. Uh, I mean, these prices are potentially going to drop in half. So you think about the profits there. So we're looking forward to seeing where the commodities end up here in the next six to nine months. Excellent. And last question is this, Tom. After all your success, helping the people that you help, building uh, real estate, doing over, I think, 140 deals, yeah. um, and, and helping a lot of people create and preserve more wealth with real estate, how do you stay centered in your values, and how do you stay encouraged to charge forward to reach new heights? Man, what a question. Um, you know, I for, for me, I'm part of the 5 a.m. club. Uh, routine is good. Uh, personal, physical health, mental health, you know, so not overworking yourself. And, you know, it's... um. It's tough. I, I also have been centered mainly around business for m most of my life. And so I'm actually in a point where I'm beginning to shift now some of my time towards more of the relationship side of life. So it's 
both of them bring happiness, but keeping that balance is really important too. So, Fantastic. And for our listeners who want to connect with you, Tom, would you remind them one last time what's the best place for them to find you? Yeah, go to our website. We have some current projects there, Red Oak VC, like venture capital, uh, redoakvc.com. Fantastic. Hey, Tom, I want to thank you for being on the show. I want to thank you for sharing uh, your wisdom about how to build wealth with land deals. And I want to encourage you to keep using the gifts that you've been given of being really good with numbers and finance and also networking, connecting with people and bringing that into a way to add value to people's lives as it comes to creating, preserving and more wealth with commercial real estate investing in land deals. And I also want to thank our listeners for listening to another episode of the Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast, also streaming on expertcresecrets.com, where we believe most high net worth individuals and those who help them, they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax referral options. Not having a clear plan is the enemy and using a proven tax deferral strategy, such as the Deferred Sales Trust, is the best way for you to defer capital gains taxes and grow your wealth. And getting with people like Tom Staub and investing in land that's developing in the smile states, Arizona, Texas, perhaps even in Florida or other North Carolina, where you're looking at pro-business, right? Pro-wealth, pro pro um uh, pro, pro building, growth. right? So pro growth is a good name for it. Thanks, Tom. And so t- connect with Tom. Um, and if I can help you at all as well, defer some capital gains tax or look at some real estate deals in California, feel free to reach out to me, capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. That's capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And please rate, review, subscribe. We're also on YouTube if uh, if you're listening to this on iTunes where we have a ton of content. So again, you can go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com and or search YouTube with Capital Gains Tax Solutions. Thanks, everybody. Take care now.